What's up guys, my name is the Below Average Gamer, aka Bag, aka Johnny Sins, and this is Assassin's Creed 1. Assassin's Creed 1 is a role-playing action game developed by Ubisoft. It's the first installment in the notorious Assassin's Creed series. The video game was released for PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 in November 2007. The plot is focused in a fictional history of real-world events, taking place primarily during the Third Crusade in the Holy Land in 1191. The story of the game runs congruent to the Third Crusade, specifically the war between King Richard's forces, the guy usually in white looking all European, and Salahadin's forces after they captured Jerusalem. The player in the present is modern day man Desmond Miles, who through a machine called the Animus relives the genetic memories of his ancestor Altair Ibn Al Altair Ibn La Altair Ibn La Okay fine, wait a second. Altair, Altair, Ibn La Ahad. Altair, Ibn La Ahad. Altair, Ibn La Ahad. Through this plot device, details emerge about a millennia old struggle between two factions the Assassin's Brotherhood, inspired by the real life Order of Assassins, who fight to preserve peace and free will, and the Templar Order, inspired by the real life Knights Templar Military Order, who seek to establish peace through order and control. Both factions fight over powerful artifacts of mysterious origins and these are known as Pieces of Eden. They want these to gain advantage over each other. As mentioned, Assassin's Creed 1 came out on November 13th, 2007. As you may be aware from my MGS1 video, I was the tender age of 12 when I got my hands on this. I remember opening the present on Christmas Eve as a Christmas gift from my parents. The reason I got it on Christmas Eve is because I was a spoiled little shit and would kick off if I had to wait another day to open my presents. So this was like a kind of peace offering ritual they did each year for their own sanity. Unwrapping this and seeing the front cover, I can still picture it, holding the PS3 box and immediately turning it over to read what it was about. It's funny how memory works, isn't it? I can remember that in clear detail all those years ago, but I can't remember anything else that happened on Christmas 2007. Why does this moment stand apart from the other memories of that event? I can't remember any other presents, what we ate, who we saw, nothing. From what I understand from my A-level psychology class that I barely passed, long-term memory is strengthened when the event you are recalling means something. Memories with meaning tend to stick around for longer and can be recalled with much more clarity. So why do I remember this so well? I'm going to get into that in more detail over the course of the video, but this game had a huge impact on 12-year-old Bag. The themes and principles in this game were where I started questioning life and truth. On the face of it, Assassin's Creed is a role-playing action game where you play as an assassin Altair. The story, however, and the events that take place in this and subsequent games opened up my mind, placed a little bomb in there and ran away before it went boom. Now, being 12 years old, I hadn't had much exposure to questioning things. I think the reason I really remember this moment is because it's almost the trigger point for where my conceptualization of the world began to change. It would be the reason for me to explore subjects like art, psychology, history and philosophy throughout my teenage years, and those interests and learnings I took part in during my adult formative years. They've really become a key part of my personality, of who I am today, and it's really crazy to think that I can track core components of myself and my actions all the way back to this point in 2007. Memories like this stick around because they mean something. And this one is clear as day because it, upon reflection, means so much to who I am. And fittingly, this game is all about memories. If you're a bit confused with what I've just said, allow me to explain. Let's get into it. After the opening cutscene where we see Altair stalking and assassinating his prey, which was very cool, may I add, we load up the game and we're met with a bright white screen before we see and hear this. I applied my heart to no wisdom. To no madness and folly. I perceive that this also was a chasing Halloween. Between much wisdom, and he's much grief. And his decrease of knowledge increased sorrow. Wait, 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 wait. What just happened? Apart from me bludgeoning the faceless woman repetitively, something that could only really happen in a 2000s game, we see a ghostly, human like aura up on the stairs whilst we hear a recitation of the Bible, 
specifically Ecclesiastes 117. This specific book in the Bible is supposedly written by King Solomon, someone who was given unusual wisdom by God. The first part of what was said alludes to the studying of opposites to reveal a deeper meaning of something. To be concerned with the truth, you must understand the untruth. It cannot be understood by study of that alone. The second part is alluding to the old adage, ignorance is bliss. Being rich as a king and unusually wise, you'd think he has it all, right? Well, what he's telling us here is that with all this wisdom he has been granted by God, he actually finds he has more grief, more worries and more sorrow as a result. I saw someone write this related analogy once too on the subject. When we go to bed, we only worry what we may do tomorrow or the following day, whereas Albert Einstein or Oppenheimer would worry about the ramifications of harnessing nuclear energy and weapons of mass destruction and what impact that would have on humanity forever into our future. Who do you think sleeps better? I can tell you for free, this wasn't something that 12 year old Bag even noticed. And it's something I only noticed going back and playing this, this time around, which is cool and an incredibly deep and based way to start the game, especially in that era. So why have they put this in the first five seconds of the game? I thought we were just playing as an assassin and killing bad guys. Well, as I alluded to at the start, this game changed the way I looked at reality. Stuff like this is where it all starts to make sense. Philosophy and religion serve as some of the main themes in the game, but it doesn't just throw you a load of quotes like this and think it's cool. Let's continue. We're shoved into another glitchy matrix town square type place and we hear some voices telling us to focus as someone tries to stabilize us. I, however, am clearly not stable as I'm battering every individual I can before we are whipped out of the illusion and into the present day. We wake up in a cold gray room with two other doctory type people standing over us. It seems we are viewing things from the perspective of the dude on the bed. This is Desmond Miles, and as we hear here, he has been kidnapped and strapped into something called the Animus. Desmond asks why this is happening to him, to which the doctor says that they need information. Information? I'm a bartender for Christ's sakes! The doctor pushes on. He accuses us of being an assassin, to which we protest. Not anymore. He notes that there was an escape relating to the subject, but doesn't elaborate any further. Desmond wants to know what they want, and the doctor informs him that they want him for his memories, which will be accessed using the animus. The doctor says they can do this with him alive or dead, and asks us to lie down, repetitively. Lie down. Lie down, please. I need you to lie down, Desmond. Lay back. Okay. And we eventually do this. The doctor who will come to know as Warren Vidich explains how the animus works. He starts with memories. He explains that memories can be found in our genetic code, much in the same way that our parents and ancestors' traits are present within our body. Traces of our ancestors' memories also lie in our genes. It's an interesting concept and on paper doesn't sound like too much of a stretch of the imagination and actually offers a logically viable explanation for instincts. Why do birds know where to migrate? It's their ancestors' memory telling them as they had experienced it already in the past and it feeds into the whole survival of the fittest evolutionary theory thing. You don't just pass on your physical traits, you also pass on knowledge. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? This is another example where 12 year old Bag started going, I never thought about it like that. Anyway, Warren yaps on about this for a bit, whilst the lady, who will come to know as Lucy Stillman, is jamming away on the animus. She explains that the memory they want to access isn't working, due to our lack of confidence into stepping into our ancestors' shoes. This is apparently due to our subconscious. The best way to explain this, I would say, is like when you realise you're dreaming and you wake up because you get too excited. So the solution is to acclimatize our subconscious by easing it into a memory that we have a better time synchronizing with. We are then thrusted into the tutorial program which is very matrixy. You might notice that the physics in this game are acting a bit strange, giving me a big thick ass. And I'll explain this later. Anyway, the tutorial shows us all the basics and I won't bore you too much with this. Although it certainly is a pretty cool and impressive tech demo at the time, as all this gameplay was pretty new and impressive, and the fidelity of the graphics for 2007 were really good. I think the character models still hold up really, really well today, whilst the mechanics are a little bit more aged, and it feels a bit clunky to control. Not enough to massively damage the experience though, a bit like GTA 4. After the tutorial, we're thrusted into a cutscene where we hear someone saying that the old, innocent man on screen doesn't need to die. We hear frantic running, footsteps getting louder, before... Fatality. 
The other assassin notes that this was against the Assassin's Creed. Man, I'm dead. We didn't need to kill him as he was innocent. We should have snuck past. A pretty brutal opening to the game as it's minus one karma point down for Altair already. Altair then reels off the motto of the Creed. Nothing is true, everything is permitted and that he should understand these words. This is pretty ironic as it's a total misjustification of his actions as the other assassin points out. Altair cuts him off saying, my way is better. Altair says that their mission is to retrieve an artifact from the temple that we're in. It is noted that this is very important. We then do some free running and practice stealth killing an enemy guard. Then we have a cutscene where the assassins debate whether the artifact they found is the Ark of the Covenant, a holy relic of God. I couldn't find much information on what this does. Funnily enough, the only thing I found was that if you touch it, you just die. Don't do it! What, Rick? Okay, what was that? Death. What kind? Instant. Altair believes that this is fake and holds no power. This is as a man named Robert Dusable walks in with some guards. Altair immediately wants to murder him. I come here for a fucking shootout, right? His brothers tell him that he should not and focus instead on the mission noting that he has already broken the creed twice and this would be a third time. Altair tells them to shut up as he's a higher rank and has more skills than them so he does what he wants. We drop down to encounter Robert and his guards. Altair tries and fails to kill Robert. His arrogance has got him separated from the other two as we hear the guards say kill the remaining assassins. Altair however just dips and that's that. So we can see here that his arrogance and non-conformance with the creed have most likely got the other two killed and they lost the artifact. This is before our memory is fast forwarded and we appear in a small town. We talk to someone and they note the master is in the tower and we make Stop our way attacking. there. We arrive at the base of the assassin's compound. This place is called Masayef which appropriately means raised platform and the place is certainly very vertical compared to the other cities and places in the game so it's pretty appropriate. We are addressed by another assassin assuming that we rushed back to steal the credit for our successful mission. Altair however doesn't say anything, most likely feeling pretty guilty. We then run up to meet the master, Al Mualim. Altair tells him about the failure of the mission. Al Mualim scolds us for the failure. He doesn't want to hear it. He asks where Malik and Kadar are. Malik then approaches wounded. Kadar, he says, has died. And he blames, of course, Altair for this. He notes that his arrogance was the reason for this, which we saw. Al Mualim is surprised by this, and Malik brings in the artifact saying that he managed to salvage the operation. Before anything can be said about this, the messenger comes in, saying that Robert's forces are attacking Masayef. Al Mualim tells Altair that his judgment can wait that he must go forth and protect Masayef. We meet another assassin that notes the Templars have already killed a lot of the innocents. He wants Altair to distract the Templars so he can save whoever is left. You might notice that there are some bugs appearing on screen and I'll come on to how I fix that shortly, but every time I killed someone their body would just go absolutely flying for some reason. We fumble our way down to the bottom of the village as I somehow fail a leap of faith, which I rightly remember isn't actually possible in this game, this was the second glitch that I faced. The bodies I could put up with as it was pretty funny, but the leap of faith was kind of essential. We successfully drive back the Templars enough that we complete the mission and are transported forward in time. And we're back at the Assassin's Tower. We see a ton of bodies which we know rightly is all our fault. Another Assassin says we're not done yet and calls us up to a tower and tells us to stand on this platform. We then get this iconic live action cutscene where Al Mulim tells Robert that his men will willingly die for their cause. We leap from the tower and fly down into hay bales. Because they can't see this ledge, this creates an illusion to the Templars that we're willing to die for our cause. Which if I were them, I'd be like, okay yeah, these guys are a bit nuts. We then make our way across the mountains to spring a trap from behind on the Templars. This section acts as a bit of an extension to the tutorial, letting us get the hang of the controls a bit more and works pretty well. We then release a trap on the Templars. Logs rain down on them from above, greatly thinning their ranks in front of the Masayef castle. We then fast forward to Al Mualim praising us for our input. He asks if we know why we were successful, saying that if we had listened in the same way when trying to retrieve the artifact that all of this could have been avoided. Altair rebutes. He did as he was asked. This angers Al Mualim, saying that Altair was arrogant, disregarded their ways and did as he pleased breaking the three tenets of the Assassin's Creed. And these tenets are, 
One, stay your blade from the flesh of an innocent. He reminds him that he killed the old man in the temple. Two, hide in plain sight. He asks if he remembers this, as in the temple he clearly drew attention to himself before he had a safe chance to strike Robert. Altair stays quiet this time. Number three, never compromise the brotherhood which, as we've just seen, he did as a result of breaking the first two tenants, and this led to many people dying. Again, Altair stays pensively and stoically quiet, only piping up to affirm that he is not a traitor, before we are promptly chefed and launched into the present day. Warren is gleefully saying that we're seeing far better adoption rates than the other subjects. Lucy is trying to pull us out, to Warren's dismay, to give us a break. They then leave and head into the conference room. We then go into our room. Man, I can't even change my clothes. <laughs> if we head into the bathroom, we can actually vaguely overhear their conversation. Why are you disrespecting me, boss? My mistake, original gangster. No, this cannot be forgiven. Now empty the compartments of your pantaloons. They were arguing about their methods. Lucy doesn't like how Warren seemingly doesn't mind if Desmond dies, and Warren for Lucy undermining him in front of Desmond. Then he says, do you want to end up like Layla? We don't know who Layla is or know what happened to her, but it doesn't sound good and we'll come back to this later. We hop down from the bathroom. A cool little detail here is that each time you sleep, the towels change in the corner. Sometimes they're messy or have a razor out and as the game progresses, they get fewer in number. A good little immersive detail to show the passing of time I just wanted to point out. Anyway, we head back out to the main room as Lucy and Warren come out of the conference room and he tells us to go to bed. I take this opportunity to wrestle back control of my situation by disrupting Lily as much as possible. I tried to short circuit her AI, but she eventually gets to where she needs to be through sheer persistence. No, fuck you, bitch! When I get near Lucy, we can interact with her to talk to her. Desmond confirms he ran away from a place called The Farm, which was a community of assassins. He said he thought his parents were crazy hippies, but this all starts to make sense now in reflection. He wanted to see the world, but understands in hindsight that maybe they were right about wanting to protect him from his enemies. Desmond continues to say how off-grid he was and how surprised he was that he was found. No real name, no credit cards, no telephone. But he says that he had a motorcycle, and Lucy immediately says that's enough for Abstergo to track him down. She says they're everywhere before stopping herself. She realises she's divulging too much, but it's a good little fish hook to take forward in the story. Abstergo at this time have a real Illuminati feel about them from this conversation alone. Lucy then goes back to her computer and tells us to go to bed. We enter our room, the door closes behind us and we get into bed. As we fall asleep, we see a flash of some symbols in red. Next thing we know, we wake up to Warren standing over us. Hello there. Warren tells Desmond to get up and they talk about the objectives of the assassins not being far away from the objectives of his organisation, which isn't said at this time, but I think it's quite obvious that they're part of the Templars or the Templars themselves, assuming that they probably exist if the assassins still do in the present day. Desmond once again voices his concern for lack of a change of clothes. We go outside and try to freak Lucy out a little bit. I try to read over Warren's shoulder before Lucy tells me to sit down in the Animus, and I do like a good little boy. We load into Altair, surprised to be alive. He notes that he saw himself get stabbed, and he felt death's embrace. al Mualim says that he saw what he wanted him to see, which in hindsight will make a lot of sense, but right now doesn't come off so literal, and is just glazed over. al Mualim says that Altair has been reborn, and gives him a quick lesson on the goals of the assassins. They fight for peace not just by killing people who disrupt peace, but peace within themselves, saying that it's necessary to have both to succeed in achieving true peace. Altair gets scolded by al Molim, showing his misunderstanding of the tenets again. He then explains to us that we've been totally stripped of our rank and possessions. We have to start again from square one, rather than killing us as Malik requested. Our first bitch task as a noob is to find out who betrayed us and lifted the gates to let in Robert's forces. I descend the fortress to the village and begin my investigation. Not before being patronized by another assassin telling us how to be an assassin, although we clearly already know. As we go down, I'm reminded about how many people seem to think running is completely inappropriate and all have a snide little comment to say. Now for us westerners, it might seem a bit weird that random townsfolk have so much to say about just running. But let me tell you, I live in the Middle East and nobody here rushes, not one bit. Everything happens in its own damn time or later, so this might actually be more accurate than I previously thought it was. We sit on a bench nearby to eavesdrop on the informant. 
This level of detail on the conversation and characters is really nice. It makes you feel that every single NPC has a voice and interacts with the world, even in the background of the action whilst it's happening. You might think it's a bit shallow by today's standards, but for 2007, it wasn't this common. We move on to investigate the basket weaver and again listen into a really realistic and well-written conversation. However, we then very obviously trail the basket weaver and very obviously pickpocket him in front of lots of people. Again, I was about to say that this is pretty unrealistic, but if you've ever been to La Rambla in Barcelona, you'll know this is totally realistic and totally possible to rob people in a crowd in broad daylight. People don't want to rock the boat. After retrieving the letter, we trail down a town crier, give him a beat down for information. Turns out he betrayed us and serves the Templars. We learned that an assassin called Jamal was the one who opened the gate. After we've completed our investigation, it fast forwards to the individual on trial in front of Al Molin. When he essentially reads him his accusations, he then shows no regret and he doesn't take the opportunity to repent for his crimes when offered. Al Molin then executes him. He then gives us a sword back. Altaya asks what will be done about Jamal, and Al Molim says that it depends on what type of person he is. Was it through fear or desperation that he lifted the gate? Or was he corrupted and did it out of his own ill-twisted intentions? He notes that the former can be saved and the latter cannot. He stays judgment until he knows which one Jamal is. This was another cool concept that I picked up on back in the day. It was an initial introduction to how right and wrong are not as defined and discreet as the two words suggest. Right and wrong are more two ends of a moral scale and can be justified in some ways. E.g. if you steal bread to feed your family, is it wrong? He then shows us a list of nine names. He calls them plague bringers and war bringers. He tasks us with killing all of them. And this is where the main story of the game gets going. We must travel from town to town and redeem these nine lives in exchange for our own, as Altair puts it. al Mualim notes that this is a generous offer and he tells us to ride for Damas and seek out the black market merchant Tamir. He must be the first to fall. He tells us to visit the Assassin's Bureau to start the mission there. Altair asks why he must ask for permission to start the mission at the Bureau, and al Mualim reminds him of his rank. He is bottom of the pile now, and not only answers to al Mualim but everyone else. We take back control of Altair, and it shows we've been granted again our hidden blade. We then make our way outside as we are stopped by another assassin. He wants us to demonstrate to his pupils some of what we know about fighting. This is a cool law friendly way to get us used to the combat skills we use in the game. Each time you kill a target, you'll receive an upgraded equipment or ability. And each time you come back here, you can learn how to use them in a real fight setting, which is cool as it reduces the learning on the job time in actual combat situations. I run out of the castle and rather clumsily knock into some people and accidentally knock a guard off a cliff. I run away from the guards and fail a leap of faith again. It was a misinput, misinput, calm down! Before hiding in a hay bale and them losing me. You would think this would be a worse crime than my previous one, but I like that the game lets you have a bit of fun. Must have been the wind. Even if it is in opposition to the law, I guess. I steal a random horse and make way to Damas. The in-between areas of this game are a bit strange. I don't really know why there isn't just a loading screen. You kind of have to run out of the city for a bit, to a loading screen, through another middle area called the kingdom, and then through another loading screen before you get to your destination. All I can say is that these middle areas are a bit like a sandbox, and I guess add some realism to the game, as the places you go don't just feel like they exist separately of each other, but it can be a bit tedious and long after doing it a few times. In the kingdom, you can climb viewpoints, fight enemies, listen to the ambient music, pick up flags and find some Templars, but that's about it until later in the game. They are somewhat liminal by the original definition, not by the new internet meme definition. We climb the first tower we see and synchronize. This reveals new objectives and areas of the map and is the primary exploratory function in the game. I then try to do a leap of faith and turns out running the game at 120 FPS really messes with it. I don't know the technicalities, but it's something like the game is trying to catch up with itself, which is also why the physics have been completely off for the opening of this video. Where this can be funny with the enemy bodies, it's pretty essential to be able to do the leap of faith. So I flicked on V-Sync, which I think caps my frames down a bit and my problems were solved. So I stole another horse, 
and was on my merry way. Throughout the kingdom, you'll be attacked on sight by guards. They don't pose too much for a threat and are fun to practice your combat abilities. I want to shout out the ambiance of some of these places and the soundtrack that goes with it comes across as really authentic and appropriate to the location the game's set in. If I were to select my favourite location out of all the series, it would be the location of Assassin's Creed 1, which nowadays would be modern day Syria, Israel and Palestine. There's something about it which feels so gritty and real compared to the other games. Whilst I also love the Ezio games and they're a very close second, this has an extra bit of darkness and brutality to it which I love, and that is partly fed in by the time period it's set in during the Third Crusade. We'll see how life for the inhabitants of these areas is anything but enjoyable throughout the rest of the game. At the end of the day, I think it's mainly down to taste, like, do you prefer Fallout 3's aesthetic? Then you'll probably like Assassin's Creed 1. Do you prefer New Vegas or Fallout 4? Then you'll probably like AC2 and the others. It's mainly just preference due to the colours used. Both are great. Moving on, we arrive at Damas. The graphics aren't holding up too great here. I can look past most retro graphics gaps like I can with MGS1, but there's something a little inconsistent about the graphics in this game. Like up close, the detail is insane, whilst at longer draw distances, it just drops off a cliff. Ooh, brother, ooh. If it were all consistent, then it would be a little easier to digest but it definitely still touches my nostalgic buttons entering each new city. When we arrive, there are a bunch of guards abusing a man in the middle of the road. It seems like for no reason, and as I touched on just a minute ago, this is a regular occurrence in the game, showing the brutality of authority in those times. It adds to my immersion and enhances the believability of the setting we're in. We of course, being the hero, attempt to save the man, but I get absolutely dunked on my first try. I learnt from this encounter that a defensive strategy yielded better results. Just jamming the attack button triggers the enemy AI to punish the gaps you open up. We kill the guards and talk to the man. This is a cool feature of the game we'll learn about now. Each time we save a citizen like this, we can link up with some scholars to get through guard barricades, when the alternative would be to fight them and have to run away and hide uh, a much longer process. They're essentially a moving hiding spot and depending on your playstyle, you may use these more than I ended up doing. We link up with the boys, clasp our hands together in prayer and slip through the front door unnoticed. When we get through, I slice up some more guards to help another civilian to unlock some more scholars and then climb my first viewpoint in Damas and leap down. After this, we head to the Assassin's Bureau. This place is only open if we're incognito. We'll have to lose guards if they're onto us before entering, which is a cool and realistic touch. It also doesn't have a front door which is cool, no one would know it existed unless you scaled all the roofs in the city. We drop in and speak to the assassin running the bureau. He tells us that the other assassins he saw earlier were bitching about us and our errors. This doesn't phase Altair, he's only focused on the target. He says that he is here to kill Tamir. The assassin tells us to search the city and gather information from the Souk district specifically. Each mission gathering information will tell us something new about the assassination. Information on where the target will be, what they'll be doing, where guards will be, etc. So the more you do, the better. I love this element of the game as it's exactly what you would have to do in a time such as this. Other games may have just given you a location on your map, fill the area up with guards and give you some options to infiltrate. But here, the more preparation you do, the more you find out, the easier the kill will become. It's really cool. My first mission is to interrogate a town crier talking about Tamir. The crier is telling us that Salahuddin's men would have turned on him during battle if not for Tamir. This is a fairly short excerpt but you get the gist. This guy is spreading propaganda on behalf of Tamir to increase his popularity, pushing him further up the scale of power in the city. We trail the town crier and just start beating his ass. He starts beating our ass back. He finally coughs up the goods. We learn that Tamir is betraying Salahuddin in some way, but only vaguely, and that he is overseeing the production of weapons currently in the city. We also murder the shit out of him after he gets all the information out. This seems a bit cruel, but Altair would ultimately be taking a risk not doing this. To keep himself incognito, he can't risk information getting back on this interrogation. However, if Jamal is offered leniency earlier in the game after betraying the assassins, maybe this guy is forced into the situation that he's in and doing it for the same reason. Unfortunately, he was not offered the same leniency. This shows a little bit of moral bias to members of the Assassin's Brotherhood and ultimately brings into question the Assassin's Brotherhood's integrity. 
for at least this is where I started to question if their strong morals and principles always applied no matter what. We make our way across the city, no music, only the sound of propaganda and market stalls shouting about their beliefs and wares respectively. We reach a souk and listen on a conversation from above. Next, we must trail this person and pickpocket the letter, which I do very poorly. I eventually get the letter and make my getaway. I want to note here that I really like the way they use depth of field, focusing on the target rather than Altair. The whole point of this is that Altair is meant to be a blade in the crowd, hiding in plain sight kind of vibe. And this is a good technical implementation to achieve that effect. We head back to the bureau and tell the assassin what we know, confirming that Tamir is in fact a very naughty boy. And we also confirm that we know where to find him and have a solid plan to strike. The assassin approves our strategy and whips out a feather. We take it, rest up, and then we head off to the souk for our first kill. We make our way across the city, engaging in what I think is the best parkour in the game. All other games, I would say, are completely unrealistic, if not bordering on so. This game feels heavy, slow, calculated, and he can't just randomly leap six meters into the air like other games. He can only do what a human can do, and call me boring, but I think this makes it way better, and I definitely feel more immersed. This is by far the most realistic game in the series. I arrive at the souk, and we blend into the crowd. We hear a conversation between Tamir and a weapons supplier. They are having problems with delivery time. The supplier is saying that he's working as hard as he can, but it isn't good enough for Tamir. The supplier says that he's asking too much, which strikes a chord with Tamir, and he goes a little bit loopy, spitting in his face for disrespecting him. But Tamir is not done, brutally murdering the man in broad daylight in front of everyone, and no one can do anything about it. This goes back to what I was saying earlier, the brutality of this era is portrayed in this game so well. It ties together with the gritty aesthetic, the soundtrack, all of it comes together really really well. A cohesion that I don't think is matched in the same way in any other game that I've played in this series. Blending into the crowd, we approach Tamir whilst he's at a market stall. Then I strike. Every time we kill a target, we get this matrixy dialogue seemingly outside of space and time. Tamir says we will pay for this. Altair says he won't profit from death anymore. Tamir queries, why him, when so many others do the same? Tamir says he is different, he serves a more noble cause than just profit, and he has brothers that also do the same. He is only a piece of the jigsaw, and the other people that form it won't take kindly to what he has done. He then says our pride will also destroy us. I personally love these, they don't need to make much sense when it comes to how you're having this conversation, etc, etc. It's just a cool bit of dialogue inserted into the game in a consistent and stylish way. I buy into it, and love it. We're thrusted back into the world and it's chaos. The souk erupts with people screaming and running. It's time to make our getaway. We do some parkour to try and get away from the guards. We exit the souk and break line of sight by getting up on the roofs. On the roofs, we'll find these little cabana type hiding places. When line of sight is broken, you can enter these to stop the guards chasing you. However, because we've just assassinated a major player in the area, there is a bell tolling until we make it back to the bureau. The guards, if they see us now, will immediately aggro if we come into contact with them. This is obviously the first mission and as a result was pretty easy, but the difficulty does go up from here. We are once again taken out of the Animus, same reason as before. Lucy insists that we need to rest. Warren leaves and we head over to riz up Lucy. So, feel like telling me who put the stick up his ass? <laughs> Desmond presses Lucy about the deadline and complains that he has been kidnapped. Lucy doesn't care and won't give him any answers. She ultimately says it's better this way and safer for the both of them, much to Desmundo's frustration. We also ask why everyone speaks in modern English in the Animus, which I guess would be a totally valid question, and maybe even a criticism of the game potentially. But Lucy explains the Animus filters it out and translates it in real time to ensure it's understandable for smooth brains like us. We then log on to Lucy's email on the computer by the Animus. You might be thinking, why is she letting you do this? But it will all make sense later. In Lucy's emails, we find some passive aggressive emails between Lucy and Warren about their pens. These also double up as access cards to their laptops. And this is important information if you want more answers in the real world. There is also a blanket email from Abstergo reminding employees about how to treat classified information and what it says in their contract. 
It reads, you acknowledge and agree that Abstergo has developed such confidential information by the investment of significant time, effort and expense, and that such confidential information provides Abstergo with a significant competitive advantage in its business. You acknowledge and agree that a breach of this agreement by you will therefore result in irreparable harm to Abstergo, the extent of which would be difficult to ascertain and in any event, money damages will be inadequate and not a remedy in the event of such a breach. You agree that in the event of a breach of this agreement by you, Abstergo shall be entitled to injunctive or other equitable relief as the court deems appropriate, in addition to any other remedies which it may have available. This is pretty threatening, huh? Money won't be adequate if you mess up here. It shows Abstergo as ruthless, and it may as well say, we're going to kill you to death if you mess up. The third email we can read is from Lucy to Warren. When we overheard their conversation earlier, Warren said she might end up like Layla, and this is addressing this in this email. Warren tells her nothing and get back to work, and has a jab at her for signing off her email, which is actually quite a funny point if you think about it. Like, we don't sign off text messages, do we? Unless you're 60 years old. This email, closely following the last one, tells a story. Layla most likely messed up, willingly or unwillingly, and leaked some confidential information or something similar. She clearly has been deleted from this world by Abstergo for that act, and it's treated as if she was never around. The machine carries on. I want to quickly draw a parallel to Jamal's treatment here. Layla and Jamal essentially both undertook betraying acts. There is a polarity here between the Templars and the Assassins on this seemingly minor detail. Layla got deleted for her mistake, whereas Jamal was given a second chance. This is an important piece of information that characterizes the differences between the two organizations. As we will see later, the longer the story goes on, these differences become really hard to find. Desmond asks about Abstergo again to Lucy and reveals that they are a huge corporation that essentially are at the forefront of all technology advancements and breakthroughs of this era. But she notes that this particular endeavor probably isn't one that is reaching the news. We head back to our room, still no clothes. So we head to bed, more red symbols flash. What are these? We sleep in our shoes as always, which is weird. The doctor wakes us up and gives us some more lore on the world. He notes that society today is basically the same as in Altair's time. He notes that it is barbaric and that the next step in societal evolution is control. Abstergo is here to control society, for peace. If everyone is controlled, then there'll be no wars he says to Desmond. And it draws another parallel between the two organizations. They want to go about it in different ways, but the ultimate goal is peace. Lucy enters the room and I am beckoned back to the Animus. I stare at her for a little. You got a tight little pussy on you, don't you? Oh, it stinks. Pick a wedgie out as Warren almost busts a fucking artery telling me to get into the Animus. Stop screwing around and lie down on the Animus. We rejoin Altair. Al Malim is happy. Altair notes what Tamir said during the death scene and asks if he needs to know more. What is the bigger picture? Al Malim said he failed the first time from knowing too much and thinking he knew best. He said that until he's really sure he's learned his lesson, it will stay this way. He gives us back a rank and gives us back our short sword. We also learn the counter kill combat ability, which is so OP and I love it. I head into the garden and... Can I touch it, please? I am disoriented. I'm a little mad. If you can't, I wasn't getting enough oxygen. Which wasn't weird at all. The gardens out here are beautiful. Color balance is exactly how I like my games to look. A little washed out, like there's dust in the air. And it's accurate to how these climates look in mountainous regions. After some messing about, I head outside practice the counter kill mechanic, then head back down to make my way to Akka. As you can see, Akka almost looks like a battlefield, with bodies littered around the entrance and instruments of war in pieces around the perimeter, and of course, an even more washed out and pale aesthetic. We dance with the local guards to save a citizen, utilizing our newfound counter kill ability that comes with cinematic finishes. I love the cinematic finishes so much, it suits this game so much too. The sound of battle in this game is amazing as well, the crunches and slices of sword fighting is depicted so well here. It really feels like you're going through bones and muscles when you kill them, which I enjoy uh, for reasons I don't quite understand. Me and the boys sneak in unnoticed and I start making my way over to the Assassin's Bureau in Akka. I used to hate this area when I first played it. It made me feel quite sick and this is the first place they introduced the rooftop guards. 
making traversal a little harder. But now I look back on it with fondness. Although the sickly vibe is still very evident, I can appreciate how well it's done now. I also find it hilarious how everyone seems to be Cockney British in Acker, as this is controlled by the forces of King Richard. I've just started this Calypso. It is fucking minging. I enter the bureau and meet assassin Rafik. I tell him I'm here to chef up Garnier. He is the Grandmaster of the Knights Hospital in Acker. Once again, he gives us pointers to gather information on where to find him and how to approach the assassination. I want to touch on Altair's outfit now. He is, in my opinion, the best girl. His attire is the perfect balance between being realistic, subtle, and very cool. Everything an assassin should be in these games. When measured on these metrics against all the other games, he wins by far, in my opinion. Others feel very over the top like royalty, and lose that subtlety that Altair has. We meet our first contact, he's one of our brothers, and wants us to stealth assassinate the archers on the roofs as they're making it hard for him to get through the city, and I happily oblige. I like these missions because it has a bit of everything but mainly focused on stealth and parkour. We have to head to another viewpoint to see what the other objectives are. I love this feature again as it's grounded in some realism at least. Where would you know where to start without a bird's eye view of the area? And even up here, you can hear people shouting. It's not completely unrealistic to imagine him sitting up there, scanning the streets to see where a town crier might be, and heading down to interrogate them. I am then thwarted by the controls. I help another civilian, and this time we're given access to some goons, who will essentially hold back guards if they are chasing us. I head over to do another viewpoint for pure enjoyment of the climbing system. How odd. After this, I head over to another objective. On the way, I encounter this motherfucker. Turns out you can run into Templars throughout the game and there are 60 to kill. I would say this is a cool feature, but you get absolutely nothing for killing all of them. I then run into Liverpool by accident and meet a typical Liverpudlian man. My objective this time is to eavesdrop in on two guards. They talk about the archers and that they're being attacked. Some archers are not in their posts because of this. One in particular example was skipping duties to visit his brother, another archer, in hospital following an attack. With this information, we head back to the bureau. We tell Rafik Wataguan in the streets. We hear that the innocent citizens are being kidnapped and tested on in his hospital. So that justifies his killing. And we then tell him how and where we're going to do it before taking the feather to start the mission. We rest up and head out to make our second kill. We then make our way over to the hospital. When we arrive, the front door is heavily guarded and the way these guys' arms are folded is enough to let me know that I'm not welcome. I know some of the guards archers are away from their posts, so I tried to get onto one of the nearby roofs and go in that way. I narrowly avoid a guard and then get up on the roof to quickly dispatch him without anyone seeing. I climb a ladder onto the roof of the hospital and silently go about taking out the guards. I then drop into the hospital. We hear mental screams and moans from the patients. This is a place where people have lost their minds. We then see this cutscene, where a man runs out screaming for help before being restrained by the guards. Garnier then shows himself, coming across as comforting and reassuring whilst the man is completely terrified of him. He says that he took the other's souls and that he won't let them do the same to him. Garnier then lets the veil down a bit and bitch slaps him. As the prisoner says, it's all lies and deception. Garnier then orders the guards to break his legs so he can't escape. <laughs> this was so graphic for me at 12 years old, I remember it actually making my knees hurt. The sound of it is horrible. Garnier then re-enters the hospital and we have to pray our way through. Praying is so OP in this game, you can literally pray your way out of any trouble. Just pray and everyone ignores you. It's great. Anyway, I keep getting pushed by these maniacs which is drawing attention to me. I need to avoid them, but there is also one of them or some guards in between me and him. It's a hard one to navigate, some may even say it's frustrating. As he goes in between his patients, most of them are terrified of him. 
but one of them is entirely grateful, saying that he owes Garnier his life and thanks him. This one encounter in isolation makes us question, is this guy really all bad? 12 year old me caught onto this and it triggered that newfound ability to question the truth in me. This is where I started, like Altair, to think for myself. This guy cannot be all bad, there is something we're not seeing here, surely. I waited to see more. I could have killed him there and then, but I wanted to see his other patients and what they had to say. Other exchanges are more mixed, but to one, the doctor affirms that they are on the right path and to remember how bad they were when they came in. He then comes back to the patient we saw in the cutscene and tells him, one day we'll look back on this and laugh. Maybe he does know better than the patients and he's just got crazy methods? I've seen enough and introduce his neck to my hidden blade. In the cutscene, he accepts death willingly and peacefully. He shows concern for whom he calls his children. He is referring to his patients here. Altair notes that he was conducting cruel experiments on them, saying that they are now free. Garnier says, free to where? The sewers, prisons and portals? Altair says that they were taken against their will and he agrees, but he says they had little will and intelligence to understand what was best for them. Comparing them to children, that they want to play with fire. Who are we to let them? We know better. He then mentions the piece of Eden that was stolen from the assassins. He is talking about the artifact that al Mualim now has after the beginning mission, but it is the first time we've heard it referred to as this. He's saying that this process was much easier when they had it, which will make more sense later, but suggests that the artifact obviously has some sort of power. Altair is surprised that he truly believed he was helping these people, and Garnier says, It's not what I believe, it's what I know. Before we have any time to think, we have to escape. I noticed a glass window smashed on the way in and beeline it for the same window to escape. This is cool as it allows you to skip running out of the front door that is probably littered with guards, archers and those maniacs that just push you over all the time. I then make a clean getaway back to the bureau and tell Rafik the good news. Altair asks Rafik what he thinks the goal of Garnier was. Rafik tells him to shut up and not ask questions. Altair is once again questioning the so-called truths that are told to him. We head back to Masayef to meet Al Mualim. Altair tells him the news and again voices his concerns to Al Mualim, specifically this time noting that one of his captives was grateful to him. Altair questions how he managed to turn enemy into friend. Al Mualim doesn't tell him to shut up this time but says that leaders will always find ways to make people follow them, be it money, threats or trickery. He even mentions herbs from distant lands that urge men to take leave from their senses. Altair accepts the wisdom but is still not convinced. He wonders why there cannot be peace between both parties, starting to understand that the goal is the same between the assassins and the people he is being asked to kill. We gain some throwing knives and the ability to tackle. On the way back down, I give in to my intrusive thoughts again and push one of our guards off the cliff. As I attempt to make my escape, I am once again thwarted by the controls. You see what I mean about the draw distance? Nonetheless, this is, at the very least, a nice vibe for sure, and I obviously love the soundtrack. This is Jerusalem. We are in Jerusalem to kill Talal. As we enter the city, we immediately encounter a town crier spreading propaganda about him. I start trailing him. When we get to a quiet corner, I take a cheap shot at the back of his head and then throw him into a wall. Unfortunately, some other blokes down here fancied a scrap and it got a bit out of hand. Thank God for 2007 game logic. I got enough blows in on the guy and the other guys just moved on. I also love the live action cutscenes where they just ram themselves right into the middle of the conversation and pretty sure they definitely witnessed this murder too. We learn Talal is a slaver and that he holds his slaves in a warehouse somewhere in Jerusalem. There is this pretty sus line that the guards sometimes say. Listen to this. Did he just say what I think he did? I head over to the bureau and this time the assassin managing the bureau is Malik, our brother from the first mission that we messed up. He lost an arm because of this, so he's still a little pissed with us. Despite this, he helps us with where to start our investigation. We head over to the market that borders the Muslim and Jewish districts. We sit down and begin eavesdropping. This is another good example of focus, position and depth of field. Altair becomes part of the background and is pretty innocuous. We complete the mission and head back to the bureau to start the assassination mission. Malik reluctantly gives me the feather of doom and we begin the mission. We head over to the warehouse where Talal is holding up. Listen to this ambience as we traverse Jerusalem. Mm. 
It's not trying too hard, not trying to be pleasant or over-engaging, just ominous, rustic and anxiety-inducing to be honest. This time it's not too easy to get to. We have to find some scholars to get through the guards. Archers man the roofs and soldiers are on all corners. However, we have the power of prayer, which immediately negates all suspicion. The power of God is truly OP. We arrive at the warehouse and the door shuts behind us. Our next target engages us in a debate. He thinks he's helping these people just like Garnier. We then get a weird cutscene where this slave asks us to save him. I walk over to him, but don't really have any idea how to help. So I just kind of give up. Sorry, mate. We then walk in to the main chamber of the warehouse and he sets his boys on us to fight for it. But he underestimates the power of our newly found counter-attack ability and we make quick work of his goons. After this, we give chase. It's a cool action sequence and it's in contrast to the previous assassinations and it's mainly focused on combat and parkour, which is a nice change up and keeps it feeling nice and varied. I don't have much trouble chasing him and assassinate him in a way that feels kind of disrespectful, kicking him in the back of the knee and just shanking him through the back of the neck. Talal said that he played his part and that his death won't stop his brotherhood continuing their work. He notes that al Mualim isn't the only one with plans for the Holy Land. He also notes that his slaves are lepers and people of disabilities. This was not for profit, he says, but instead he believes he was saving them. He points out the irony that al Tayyir is also just following orders, that he is ignorant to the truth and doesn't understand the bigger picture. It's a very strange and condescending tone for someone to take on their deathbed. I realise they all seem so surprised to be targeted. It makes us think if we're missing something yet again. And with each kill, more is revealed. This time, when we escape, there are more guards after us. The AI is so funny sometimes, just that right amount of dumb to make it really enjoyable. This guard literally pushes his mate to his death whilst looking for us, then immediately jumps to his own death after. The guard that was nearby when this happens then says this. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very Bethesda. We return to Malik and he is super pissed. Oh, I know, I know. In fact, the entire city knows. At this point, I kind of feel like he's just upset about his arm still, which is understandable. He literally asked Al Mualim to kill us, so he's not exactly going to be all sunshines and rainbows now. He lectures us about how he went about our kill and that it was too loud or some shit, but Altair is like, shut up. I did it, didn't I? We are then ripped out of the animus because it's overheating. Warren is super pissed when we come out and conveys his anger the only way a corporate man his age knows how to, by demanding more reports from Lucy. Desmond asks why he's always shouting at her. Lucy played a role in the assembly of the animus, so when it doesn't perform, he takes it out on her personally. She also mentions that Warren saved her life, so if he wants to yell a bit, then he can. Desmond pries, and Lucy says she is somewhat a prisoner herself. She starts yapping about her life story. Long story short, she didn't have any cash and Waza sent her a letter trying to riz her up and he ended up offering her a job and now she's here. She also thinks that Abstergo maybe manipulated all of the events in her life leading up to this point and she says they're certainly capable of doing such a thing. She then recounts the story of when she was almost kidnapped and Warren stepped in to save her. To me it sounds like it was orchestrated by Abstergo, the kidnapping. As Lucy even says, she knew one of the guys doing it. I then go to the bathroom IRL and block Lucy's pathing whilst the Animus just sits there making fart sounds like Alexa. Fart for me. Okay, here's big fart. Oh, shh. Oh. That was a deep one. Oh, yeah. Shall I play another fart sound? Yeah, give me another one. Come on. Oh. She then tells us to go to bed, but I'm not tired, so I start snooping around before heading to my room. Someone has been in my towel closet and they left the access code to our door in there. Who could this be? Only person in here with us is Warren and Lucy. I head back out and try to log into Warren's computer, but apparently baldy prick 1969 wasn't the password. I pick up Lucy's access pen and snoop through her emails some more. She's asking even more questions about Layla, this time to whom we assume is like the HR rep for Abstergo or something. But they're also not allowed to talk about it. Lucy presses some more and Nancy copies in Warren and a bloke named Alan. Warren puts it pretty bluntly, she after she got in a relationship with someone called Newman. And as far as I'm aware, this is all we know about these characters. It's more there as a device to characterise the Abstergo organisation than to lead anywhere else. We head to bed after this, again seeing the red flashes. Rise and shine. Jesus Christ, just burst in like that all chipper? What a freak.
Warren tells us we don't appreciate the work that Abstergo does and that they change the world in hundreds of ways every single day and that every single breakthrough in all fields were made by Abstergo in the last millennium or by their predecessors. Yeah, if you can't tell these guys are the Templars yet, then you're just smooth brained. But Desmond shows how smooth his brain is by saying that Warren is clearly exaggerating. Warren then says this. To be fair, we don't invent them. We find them. Find them? They're gifts, Mr. Miles, from those who came before. And just like that, we hop back into the mystery machine to play Stabbing Simulator 1191. Al Mualim thanks us for killing three of the nine people on the list. He tells us our work is just the beginning. King Richard, after his victory at Acre, is planning to move to Jerusalem. Just a quick note that this would explain why everyone is seemingly English in Acre. Salahadin is surely aware of this and is preparing for the war. Altair says, why don't I just kill these two guys? And Al Mualim says, no, it would scatter their forces and subject the Holy Land to the bloodlust of 10,000 aimless warriors. He says we must concern ourselves with the men who govern in their absence. He gives us three more names. Abu Nakud, the wealthiest man in Damascus. Majuddin, regent of Jerusalem. William of Montferrat, liege lord of Acre. What are their crimes, Altair asks. al Mualim says greed, arrogance, slaughter of innocents. He then tells us to walk amongst the citizens of their cities to see for ourselves. This makes pretty good sense here on the face of it, to me anyway, and Altair seems to buy into it. Al Mualim notes that the guards' suspicion levels are heightened due to all the stabbings we've been doing recently. We gain the new grab break ability and can now catch a ledge whilst falling, both pretty useful mechanics that we'll frequently use going forward. I practice some combat skills as usual and head out. This time, when leaving the castle, we're allowed to fast travel to each of these cities, saving us repeating our journeys through the kingdom. I am back in Acre, ready to kill William of Montferrat. He is in charge whilst Richard is out fighting the war. The unnamed assassin tells us that there's a conflict between Richard and his brother William. He tells us to start our search for information at the market in front of Richard's citadel and on the border of the Hospitaller district. I love this autonomy it gives the player. You have to actually listen and open up your map to find these places. No waypoints. It just trusts you, are paying attention and have some level of brain to go and find these places. I head out onto the rooftops of the grey cityscapes of Acre taking out archers on the way and scaling viewpoints for information. I get a lead, a pickpocket mission. But this time, the mission is in a restricted area and I accidentally alert the guards trying to walk right in there. The difficulty is increasing slightly and I like that they've reused mechanics we're already familiar with to do this. It makes us use our brains to figure it out rather than just having to go and level up or grind to get stronger to be able to access an area with more ease. It's systems like these that I think games today lack. Enemies in modern games will just get more powerful or increase in number and you'll typically have to go and get a better weapon or grind XP to make it easier. Here however, because we've alerted them and led them away from the door and around the back of the building, we've done a full circle and we managed to get back to the entrance before the guards do, which means we can walk straight in praying not to attract attention. Again, other games would simply have the guards respawn here once out of sight lines, so this is two thumbs up from me on this emergent gameplay event. Great stuff from the 2007 title. Anyway, we eavesdrop in on the conversation and hear two men talking about the repairs at the fortress, and one of them says that this is to the advantage of anyone trying to access it. They then disagree about a saying in the Bible. One man says, God helps those who help themselves. The other man disagrees. He says that the Bible actually says the opposite. It's about being patient and faithful and waiting for the Lord to decide if he wishes to assist. The second man is correct and the phrase is one of the most often quoted phrases in the Bible that doesn't actually appear in it. It actually appears in a political writing piece from 1698 which features a manuscript written by Algonon Sidney, a man who was executed for treason relatively shortly after writing it. Sidney believed that individuals have the right to choose their own form of government and that if that government became corrupt, the people retained the power to abolish it and form another. Now, for a throwaway conversation on essentially an optional side mission, that level of detail is pretty insane, isn't it? To go to this length to back up what Al Mulin was saying about listen to the citizens, they're also not happy with these men we want to kill, this event alone is enough for me to love this game. I forgot to mention this when I was originally recording, but the book is obviously written in 1698, but we're in 1191 in this game. So how are these two guys quoting a book from the future? Um, 
if you know the answer to this, let me know, let me know down in the comments because I, I have no idea. Anyway, the other man says they've waited long enough, which is something they can both agree on this time. It seems they're conspiring against the government they live under, similar to us, but this isn't elaborated on much further from here. But as I said, it at least builds on what Al Mulin was saying earlier. Walk the streets and see what the citizens think of these people. With this information, we move on and look elsewhere for a viewpoint to further our investigation. I noticed a giant church next to us and the little kid in me remembers that this church is the highest in Acre and I just can't help myself but go and climb it. Whilst I love the realism and the number of lower viewpoints and their purpose, i.e. the lower you are, the more you can observe and listen to gather information and trigger your next objective, the big ones are fun to climb and are a good light problem solving exercise to take a break from the main game. It's nicely balanced. When you get closer to the top, there is no music, only wind, just you and one eagle. Listen to this. The lack of ambience is done really well here. I leap off and continue the investigation. This time we interrogate a man preaching at the front of the church. He's spreading propaganda about William. This acts in contrast to what Al Mualim said and the previous experience we just had. It actually does well again to blur the line between right and wrong. We start to think about the Assassin's Creed. Nothing is true, everything is permitted. And the number of ways that this can be interpreted. Nothing is true, it seems only opinion exists to determine right and wrong here. Some men think one thing and others think the opposite. Ultimately, we follow what Al Mulim tells us to do, but we can no longer view this in complete truth, can we? Altair is obsessed with doing right. All throughout the game, in one way or another, we'll see that this idea that he may not be doing the right thing will grow. Anyway, this time, when we tail the man, he doesn't really go anywhere discreet and we are forced to start a fist fight in a more busy alleyway. Altair interrogates him and he tells us that it's impossible to reach William, but gives us information on what he will be doing and where he will be going. And that's enough for us. This time, we have to complete three missions before starting the assassination mission. The next one is stealth assassinating archers, which we've done before. This time it's three archers to kill. Once we're done, we head back to the bureau and start the mission. We're going to strike after Richard's visit, when William will most likely be distracted. We get Rafiq's approval and head out. We arrive at William's citadel and witness Richard and William arguing. Richard is patronizing William and shitting all over his ideas and actions that he's taken. Everyone's listening to this, so he's going to be pretty pissed. And I have to say, he be rocking a yee ass haircut, which doesn't help. Richard leaves back to the front lines, looking very epic. And William says that there will be no place for people like him in the new world. This affirms that William is one of the conspirators against Richard. But we have heard this on Salah side too. Is there a group of people conspiring on both sides or one group? We make our way through the people in the Citadel keeping a low profile. One stray fart could reveal our location right now with groups of guards that will aggro if you get too close to them. I get up high and take out the guard watching over him, and luckily my only witness falls off the other roof and breaks his legs, and we can hear him crying over William's speech, which is, again, another really funny moment. William kills two guards as a warning to the others, and sends the rest on their way in the knowledge that they too can end up like these two guards if they're caught lacking. I feel like this is really funny timing, a speech to the guards about being at their best whilst one slips off the roof and breaks their legs and can be heard crying in the background. When he is alone, I drop in and put him to sleep. William tells us that he was planning to save Acker, not for his son or for himself, but for the people that will form part of the new world. Altair asks why he was stealing their food. He says he took possession of that so that when the lean times came that it would be rationed properly. He tells us that his district is without crime apart from the ones committed by us, of course. He also tells us that he wasn't training his guards to fight, but teaching them the merits of order and discipline. He says these things are hardly evil and Altair doesn't disagree, but notes that they are cruel and cannot continue. William says our actions are not freeing anyone and are actually damning them to a worse fate. Altair doesn't say anything back to this and we have to now escape the lockdown citadel. The gates have all dropped and there are loads of stronger variant type guards chasing me. I climb up to the parapets and try to fight some of them off but I start to get spanked. I can't find a safe way down and I'm brutally slashed down by one of the guards making my mind up for me. I then hot foot it the fuck out of there to a hidey hole and when the pressure is finally off I just decide to do this for some reason.
On the second attempt, I almost get crowded out by the 9 million guards. Running was proving hard, so I put on my big boy pants and tried to fight them. At least enough to make space for myself to get away. Back to safety, back at Masayef, Al Mualim is once again happy with our success. He says that we're freeing cities and this promotes peace, the ultimate goal of the Brotherhood. By freeing them of corruption, we are healing the hearts and minds of the people. Altair notes what William said, and that all men we are killing still do not regret their actions and still think they were doing right. He asks what connects these men, and Al Walim says this. Ah, but as an assassin, it is also your duty to still these thoughts and trust in your master. For there can be no true peace without order, and order requires authority. You speak in circles, master. You commend me for being aware, then ask me not to be. Which is it? Altair is right. William is trying to control the people of Akka, but for the good of all, to ensure peace. Al Mualim says that they must be freed to know peace, then immediately after references order and authority. Altair quite rightly picks him up on this. Al Mualim says that Altair must be aware, questioning, but also at the same time turn a blind eye to Al Mualim's goals and not to question those. There's a duality of what is expected of Altair. It seems that whatever Al Mualim says is just to get Altair to do his bidding, manipulating him through his words, and Altair is catching on to this. At this point, after killing five or so targets, you might notice that the game is getting very repetitive. Go to City X, scale Y viewpoint, complete Z objective, kill the target, back to Masayev, have a conversation, get a new combat ability, test it in the ring, then the cycle starts over and over and over. This is one of the key criticisms of the game which is worth highlighting. And whilst the variables change in each loop, it is very repetitive, especially doing this nine times. Five, I would say, should have been the maximum for this, and they could have actually cut some targets out or condensed the amount you did for each target to make the game better. But without looking into it too deeply, it doesn't completely ruin the experience for me, as I enjoyed the actual gameplay enough to go through it all. From now on though, I'll skip over anything we've done before for everyone's benefit. We head back to Damas for Abu Nakud, the merchant king of Damas. We start our search in the northwest and west near the mosque and the soup. We do a pickpocket mission and learn that our target is holding a festival within his palace. I then see a flag that I don't really want, but for some reason can't help myself but go and try and get. And uh, yeah. Yeah, the controls can be so ass in this game sometimes. An informant then says this to us. Such a long time. Any news of Ada since she left? Wait a second, who is Ada? Was it Altair's love interest? Why didn't Altair say anything? Why has no one else ever mentioned this name? We'll come back to this later. For now, we have to kill some of the captains roaming the streets without being noticed, of course. These missions are a step up in difficulty. It's really hard to stay anonymous. The guards' alert levels are way up. But we complete it and we gain a map of where the guards are stationed at the palace. After another eavesdropping mission, we can now start the real mission. We report to Rafiq that everyone in town hates the merchant king and that we plan to use the festival as a distraction to strike. And when we arrive at the festival, oh my god, you sir are fat and ugly. And what are those growths on your face? I don't think we need to kill this guy. I feel like natural causes are not that far behind us. He comes across pretty nice, saying for everyone to eat and drink as they please. Is this another nice guy? Everyone in here is cheering him too, but then he flips on them, saying that all of them do not appreciate him and that he hears the negativity towards him behind his back. He criticizes them for giving up money easily for war efforts, but when he preaches compassion, tolerance and mercy, they mean nothing to these people. He says he's had enough and pledged himself to a new cause that will bring about a new world where everyone can live side by side in peace, then locks the doors and people start dying. Wait a second, so from the last two murders, this guy and William are saying the same thing. This all but confirms that there is a secret group of people from both sides of the war and they want to take power. Could it be the Templars? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think that's pretty obvious. But now coming onto the forefront of the story, and if you cannot see it right now, then it starts to get a bit more obvious from here on out anyway. The speech finishes and chaos ensues. People are dying from poison, arrows and being slaughtered by the guards. We pursue the fat man very easily and end him in front of some very lazy guards. He asks why we did this. We say he stole money from his people and sent it away to some unknown cause. Altair wants answers this time and is growing in frustration about being kept in the dark. He tells us that we'll come to know the group of people he serves soon. He also says, why would he finance a war to a god that thinks he's an abomination? I think this is due to his disabilities maybe? Which explains why he's the only fat dude with sores on his face in this game. 
At least that's what I thought until I read the AC wiki. It says this. Because of some of his mannerisms, such as his style of dress, his speech about people of all kinds living together, his words about not serving the same god that calls him an abomination, the way he caresses one of his guards, and the fact that many characters refer to him as different, it can be inferred that Abul Nakud is homosexual. Okay, I hope you'll forgive me for this, but I am not going to start talking about sexuality and religion. Not worth it. Nope. When we get back to Masayef, Altair wants answers. No more riddles. Al-Molim is surprised at this. We notice on his desk the artifact from the start of the game. This is the first time we've seen it in one of these conversations, and it will stay with al from here on out. Altair says he won't kill any more without knowing why he's doing this. Too many details don't add up. He worries he may be killing good people. He accuses Al-Molim of deception, which doesn't go down well. Al-Molim says he will need to find another dog, but Altair says if he has another one, he would be using it already referencing that it would be easier to have someone doing this that didn't ask so many questions. But Altair is the best assassin there is. I want to let this dialogue play out because I miss when games dialogue were written and acted this well. I just miss it. So here you go. You said the answer to my question would arise when I no longer needed to ask it. So I will not ask. I demand you tell me what binds these men. Uh, what you say is true. These men are connected by a blood oath not unlike our own. Who are they? Non nobis, domine non nobis. Templars. Now you see the true reach of Robert de Sable. All of these men, leaders of cities, commanders of armies. All pledge allegiance to his cause. Their works are not meant to be viewed on their own, are they? But as a whole, what do they desire? Conquest. They seek the Holy Land not in the name of God, but for themselves. What of Richard? Salah Hedin? Any who oppose the Templars will be destroyed. Be assured they have the means to accomplish it. Then they must be stopped. That is why we do our work, Altair. To ensure a future free of such things. Why did you hide the truth from me? That you might pierce the veil yourself. Like any task, knowledge precedes action. Information learned is more valuable than information given. Besides, your recent behavior had not inspired much confidence. I see. Altair, your mission has not changed, merely the context within which you perceive it. And armed with this knowledge, I might better understand those Templars that remain. Is there anything else you want to know? What about the treasure Malik retrieved from Solomon's temple? Robert seemed desperate to have it back. In time, Altair, all will become clear. Just as the role of the Templars has revealed itself to you, so too will the nature of their treasure. For now, take comfort in the fact that it is not in their hands, but ours. If this is your desire. It is. I feel like if you try and put that much dialogue with only one camera angle in a game nowadays, Gen Z will literally just bug out and start swiping the screen, hoping to get some overstimulating subway surfers ASMR soap cutting videos into their brains to ensure their serotonin levels don't drop below 99%. That's partly why I love these games of yesteryear. We're trusted not to be utterly brain dead. The devs can just tell the story how they want to. The next target is Maj Shadeen. He is the incumbent ruler of Jerusalem. We have some slightly friendlier dialogue with Malik, showing that our actions are starting to align with the values he expects from the assassins. The relationship that Altair ruined is starting to slowly repair, which is very nice. I complete all the investigations and get back to Rafiq. I plan to kill Majdudin at a public execution. Rafiq tells us that one of us is due to be executed, as in one of our assassin's brothers, and we cannot let the assassin die. When we get to the execution, Majdudin is putting on a show, telling the people of all the wrongdoing that those up for execution have done. They need to be wary of these people, that they live among them, and they can lead them astray. Two men that we eavesdropped on earlier then try to attack Majdudin but are promptly nailed by the archers. There are four people up for execution, a harlot, a thief, a gambler, and a heretic. This one is obviously our assassin brother. I decide to act quickly to disrupt proceedings so that no one dies. I didn't care about stealth this time. I start a fight with the guards and try to execute Majdudin, but he fights me off and then I literally have to kill all of Jerusalem's guards here if I'm going to succeed. I love when I get into these situations because it's not inherently difficult but you have to focus and choose each action carefully and you never know who's going to attack or what type of attack they'll go for. 
I actually kill Maj halfway through this wider battle. This time he is upset, saying that his work had only just begun. He said that he wanted power only. He agrees with the Templars that order was needed, but he said his main objective was to feel like a god but only use the Templar's goals to further his own. This time, this guy is different, right? It's more to show a reflection of how far we, Altair, have come. Our humility here is in complete juxtaposition to the arrogance and greed of Majduddin, something Altair at the start would have been quite similar to. I'm glad they did this, as it doesn't need to say the same thing every time. It avoids the death cutscenes becoming too repetitive, and we're already aware of the core conspiracy now after talking to Al-Mulim after the last death. After murdering everyone, we slowly walk out like a boss. This game is fun in stealth for sure, but that was a really, really fun fight, just fighting everyone. But it does ruin the immersion a little bit knowing I can fight off 20 guards. What's the point in staying quiet other than it being more efficient? Not much. Rafiq doesn't berate us this time, it seems like he's beginning to trust us again. After this, we're pulled out of the Animus, and it's been a while since we had some time out of it. Warren says he's ending the session, and has a weird combo on the phone, and he tells us we're in trouble. Apparently the assassins are coming to rescue us, and he blames Desmond for this. But as we know, we didn't talk to anyone, so who did? Lucy then explains that Abstergo are Templars, which wasn't obvious at all. Warren calls her and she has to leave. She says that the answers to all of our questions are right in front of us. We just have to know where to look. Hinting at the fact that we can read her emails or Warren's if we were smart enough to get his pen earlier, which we weren't, but we do get it later so we'll cover what's on his laptop then. I accidentally hit the sleep button rather than reading Lucy's emails, so we sleep and then we see the strange red glyphs again. And Warren is in a lovely mood this morning. Get in the Animus. You forget how the Animus works? Select the memory on the menu in front of you and let's begin. Altair sums up his work to date and has the following conversation with Al Molim. I'll do my best to answer. The merchant king of Damas murdered the nobles who ruled his city. Mejdeddin in Jerusalem used fear to force his people into submission. I suspect William meant to murder Richard and hold Akka with his troops. These men were meant to aid their leaders. Instead, they chose to betray them. What I do not understand is why. Is the answer not obvious? The Templars desire control. Each man, as you've noted, wanted to claim their cities in the Templar name, that the Templars themselves might rule the Holy Land and eventually beyond. But they cannot succeed in their mission. Why is that? Their plans depend upon the Templar treasure, the Peace of Eden. But we hold it now, and they cannot hope to achieve their goals without it. What is this treasure? It is temptation. It's just a piece of silver. Look at it. What am I supposed to see? This piece of silver cast out Adam and Eve. It turned staves into snakes, parted and closed the Red Sea. Eris used it to start the Trojan War and with it a poor carpenter turned water into wine. It seems rather plain for all the power you claim it has. How does it work? He who holds it commands the hearts and minds of whoever looks upon it, whoever tastes of it, as they say. Then Gagne's men? An experiment. Herbs used to simulate its effects, to be ready for when they held it. Talel supplied them. Tamir equipped them. They were preparing for something. But what? War. And the others, the men who ruled the cities, they meant to gather up their people, make them like Gagne's men. The perfect citizens, the perfect soldiers, a perfect world. Robert de Sable must never have this back. So long as he and his brothers live, they will try. Then they must be destroyed. Which is what I've had you doing. There are two more Templars who require your attention. One in Akka, known as Sibran. One in Damas, called Jubair. I left this bit in because it's really cool how AC1 inserts itself into real life religious history. This piece of Eden, an apple shaped piece of silver, Al Mualim says was responsible for casting out Adam and Eve, referring to Genesis 2 in the Bible. This is, of course, the familiar story of Adam being tempted to bite the apple from the snake, of which he was forbidden to do so and being cast out of God's holy garden with Eve. It turned staves into snakes, again referring to Exodus 4.2, 2, 
where Moses' staff turns into a snake and back again. And most significant of all, he says with it that Jesus turned water into wine. This suggests that Jesus used this artifact to perform his miracles. This raises two questions. The Bible in those days was basically considered truth. It was that era's version of present day science. It explained all the questions that man had. To question it would be like someone saying gravity is not the reason we stand on the ground without flying away. Now this suggests that the Bible is also full of falsehoods, for it incorrectly attributes miracles and acts of God to God himself, rather than this artifact, linking back to the saying that nothing is true. The second question is, if this little ball is responsible for the miracles and unexplainable phenomena in the Bible, then is there really even a God? And as suggested, maybe Jesus wasn't the son of God, but a mere man, that used this artifact to become a phenomena himself. Now, if you're not listening here, you will just completely glaze over this detail, but 12 year old me was getting my mind blown at this point, but I don't want to spoil anything in case you still haven't played this almost 20 year old game. So we'll finish this thought off later. Altair gets a new shiny sword and we learned the defense break skill, which is also really useful at this stage of the game. We head back to Damascus and we're here for Jubayer, Salahadin's chief scholar. Even Rafiq questions this kill, but says we should not question the master. We find out the location of Jubayer from the first mission, from the second we learn which garden he will be in. On the way to the third mission, I get into a long overdue street fight for punching a beggar. The guards don't seem to mind this, which tells you a lot about the style of ruling in okay. this city. I complete the final mission and we find out that Jubayer is planning on burning books to rewrite at least local history with the help of his scholars. When we arrive, we see that he is in fact burning books as we suspected. One of the guards is trying to tell him the beauty of the information that he is burning and that it's a good thing to have to help us not repeat the same mistakes as we did in the past. He opposes that they are filled with lies, poisoning our minds, that they are weapons, that it makes people weak by relying on the words rather than their own knowledge and intuition. He also poses that we never know the true intention of the person writing them, so they are dangerous. They cannot settle their disagreement and the man is thrown into the fire. Again, this reinforces the breadth of the meaning of the saying that nothing is true. 12 year old bag was really starting to freak out here as once again, this is something I'd never question. Who writes the words of the books that I read and internalize as knowledge? How can I trust that this person writing them had good intentions for me? This is pretty profound and is even more true in today's age than 2007. The problem of fake news and misinformation is the worst it's ever been. The truth changes from one day to another in our world. It's impossible to know anything. Back in 2007, many people were less conscious of this fact than we are now. So for this to be a theme of a game such as this is really noteworthy. I've mentioned it already before in this video about the gray area between right and wrong that they are on a spectrum rather than two discrete options. Here, I think we can draw a parallel to how these men are dealing with the problem. One thinks books tell truth and that they should be believed. One thinks books tells lies and that they should be burned. We know that neither of these are true. We understand that truth is also, in fact, on a spectrum. Some things written will be more true than others. Truth is also not a discrete concept. Remember the saying that history is always written by the victor. Anyway, I need to stop yapping and just kill this dude. As you can see on screen, there is one problem. Which one is he? We have six different targets that are all wearing the same outfit. There is no right or wrong way to do this to be honest, just pot luck. When we eventually get him, he has this to say. He blamed the war of the third crusade between Richard and Salahuddin on written documents as the fuel for their fury and their beliefs. These documents he's referring to are the Quran and the Bible. As previously mentioned, he wanted to free people from books and for them to rely on their own observations in their own experience to inform their own truths. This was not a man following orders. He truly believed in what he was doing. He then poses another question to Altair that by killing him, he is destroying a source of knowledge like those books that he wishes to save by killing him. Altair once again cannot disagree with this notion, instead posing it as a necessary step in the right direction. And I agree with Altair here. The answer is not to destroy all knowledge or to believe everything that is written, but to be educated to understand the nuances of what is read and taught. This harks back to the beginning when Altair is misinterpreting the phrase, nothing is true and everything is permitted. He was not educated and took his understanding of the phrase for truth and it led him astray. 
We see his character arc develop in so many ways in this game, and it's actually pretty incredible how they tie it all together. Once back with Rafiq, Altair ponders the irony that we are silencing those who oppose us, and that this target was doing the same thing. How will we any different? There are no disagreements this time between Al Mualim and Altair. He instead asks Altair the following. What is the truth? We place faith in ourselves. We see the world the way it really is and hope that one day all mankind might see the same. What is the world then? An illusion, one which we can either submit to, as most do, or transcend. What is it to transcend? To recognize nothing is true and everything is permitted that laws arise not from divinity but reason. I understand now that our creed does not command us to be free. It commands us to be wise. Do you see now why the Templars are a threat? Whereas we would dispel the illusion, they would use it to rule. Yes, to reshape the world in an image more pleasing to them. That is why I sent you to steal their treasure. That is why I keep it locked away. And that is why you kill them. So long as even one survives, so too does their desire to create a new world order. At this point, I find the game kind of quells the suspicion in here of Al Mulim. It makes it all make sense. It flip flops between what is right and wrong so much, but I'd say at this point, ourselves, Al Mulim, and Al Tair all seem to be on the same page for the first time in the game. We understand that what the Templars want and what we want is the same, but the way they pose to do it is more evil than ours, and for that we must stop them. With all that aligned, we head off to kill the final of the nine. We are back in Akka. Our target is Sabrand. He's the newly appointed leader of the Knights Teutonic. We're told to go and search the docks and the chapel overlooking it. The investigations missions start to get pretty hard here. Templars roam the streets with groups of guards looking for you, and if you get near them, it will cause them to aggro. I couldn't help but think how nice it was to play a game that was neither too hard nor too easy, just a nice challenge at this stage. Once we've activated the mission, we head over to the docks. The docks are heavily guarded, but I parkour over the guards and make my way around another set by hopping over the boats. We encounter Sabrand interrogating a holy man. He believes he was inciting violence towards him, betraying him in some way. No one is sticking up for him. Sabrand is interrogating him because he looks like an assassin and is fully gaslighting him here, almost willing him into a false confession. Sabrand is super paranoid and we've clearly rattled him with the previous killings. The holy man calls for others to stop Sabrand, but no one says anything still. And Sabrand kills him in broad daylight. He then puts on this naughty helmet. My first attempt, I tried to get to the boat he is on by jumping across all the other boats docked up. When I arrive, I'm greeted by numerous Templars and I'm kicking their ass a bit too hard. So I guess the game just says, nope, and I die here for no reason, even though I've got heaps of health. What the fuck was that? On my second attempt, I... Third attempt, I throw around a drunken sailor for fun. As I bridge his ship, I can hear some insane shouting and arrows zipping around. I think he's trying to shoot the seagulls. This guy is fully rattled by us, isn't he? Anyway, we pray our way past all the guards and right onto his ship. When we get there, I hit this sick ass jump kick. Sabran's part in this is quite interesting and there's three things to touch on. Firstly, his part in this play was to blockade the docks, to stop any aid being sent to the Holy Land from other kings and queens to fight against the Templars when they eventually struck. Secondly, Altair opens the scene by highlighting that Sabran is scared, which was quite evident from all the attempted seagull murders. Sabran says he is scared because he knows what happens after death, thanks to the treasure, referring to the artifact. He says there is nothing, and this life is all that we have. Lastly, Altair accuses him of trying to conquer the Holy Land, but Sabran corrects him to free the Holy Land from the tyranny of faith. Altair queries, how can you be trying to free it when you murder anyone who speaks against you and attempt to control the whole damn place? Sabran retorts with a simple, I followed my orders. Same as you. I get on my bike and hop for to out of there, back to the bureau. Altair says this while speaking to Rafiq. What if I'm wrong? What if these men are not meant to die? What if they mean well? Misguided, perhaps, but pure in motive. I am but a Rafiq, Altair, and such things are beyond me. Also, side note, pretty sure I've referred to every assassin in the bureaus as Rafiq, like in all the cities, so yeah. Rafiq. Anyway, we're chucked out of the Animus. This time we are dazed and confused. Warren is being talked to like a piece of shit by some big man that wants a progress report or something. 
When we come to speak to Lucy, Desmond thinks there's a problem with the animus, saying that it just ejected him for some reason. Lucy says, I'm pretty sure you should shut up. I'm going to come. Desmond demands answers, and she says that we have to stop them. What does she mean, we? Desmond wonders why they are wasting time. It looks like the artifacts are at Masayef. Lucy says that that one was already destroyed. They're hoping that by going into Desmond's memory, that they will find out where the other ones are. Desmond is surprised that there are more than one of these things. Lucy sighs, saying that we really have no idea. Warren is calling and getting suspicious of Lucy, so we can't talk to her anymore. We go back into our room and sneak back out like a naughty child going for a midnight snack. We head over to Lucy's email and read this. We have an email from Faster Cheaper Meds. Subject, problems down there. And it reads, wonder why it is everyone laughs at you? I'll let you guess. Let's just say she's probably getting it bigger and better from someone else that isn't you. How can you hope to compete? Rest assured there are some good ways. Click the link to see. Now what do you notice about this email? It says, we'll be there soon. This is some goofy ass way to send a secret code. If it is the assassins, you can tell why the Templars are winning. That's all I'll say. Aside from the goofiness, this does build the excitement. This story is coming to an end and it does well to get us hyped that something is about to happen. We head to bed and we're once again woken up by a very chipper Warren. Time's wasting, Mr. Miles. He tells us that we're nearly done. Desmond is aware that Warren will not let him walk out of here alive. He also asks about what he sees in the animus. He says that it seems off, like it doesn't quite match up with history. Warren then patronizes us by saying, Ooh, ooh, oh, it doesn't match up with your history books. Oh, what a surprise, you idiot. Desmond says that there are all sorts of documents and source materials that say otherwise, but he reminds us that what we are seeing is literal history. There is no room for interpretation. He also harks back to the point that anyone can write a book, that they can say anything they want in it, and reminds us that people used to, and still do, think that the earth was flat, similar to his ancient Templar colleague, right? He also makes a joke about the moon landing and a book that claims the world was created in seven days. He says it's a bestseller, in fact. 12-year-old me at this point was like, mind blown. I understood the points about books, etc., but it's not until he said this, that I realized that the point also applies to religious texts. Before this line, I only began to think about the possibilities of history textbooks being false. Desmond asks where he was going with this. Warren repeats the assassin's motto, nothing is true. We hop back into the animus. Al Mualim tells us it's time to go for Robert du Sable again, the man we failed massively to kill at the beginning. We've come full circle. This time, we understand the creed and all its teachings. It's time to implement what we learned. Al Mualim talks of the insanity and greed that possessed him once he came into contact with the artifact. This said, as he has it right there on his desk, sure nothing will go wrong with Al Mualim holding it, right? Anyway, Al Mualim touches on the common goal of peace between Robert and us, confirming that we wish to achieve it through free will and they control. Now this is a good time to sum up the irony of this. Try to stick with me in this. If all of these assassinations are a message to Robert to stop trying to achieve peace, in such a way that he is, then are we not controlling people to achieve peace? We are stopping them acting freely. Is this method of delivering freedom amongst men to ultimately achieve peace even feasible? Surely the fact that the Templars use their free will to choose to control everyone to achieve peace is proof that free will will never achieve peace. So what we end up doing is controlling people to achieve peace, like Templars. We're literally doing the same damn thing. Altair showed in his last few assassinations that he is on the brink of realizing this. How many times did I just say peace? Anyway, it's ironic nonetheless. I head back to Jerusalem where we meet Malik. I ask him about Robert. He confirms he is here. He advises us not to let vengeance get the better of us. And Altair says he is instead motivated by knowledge. He wants to know why Robert is doing what he's doing. He talks how the Templars are part of the Crusader army, but they are only part of this, sort of as their actual allegiance is to Robert. We are told to start our search near the hospital and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. We complete our investigation and find out that Robert will be at the burial of Majtudin, you know, the big sweaty guy we killed. When we get there, we blend into the crowd and the procession starts. Robert looks a little shorter here, no? Looking a little sus? It also looks like he can see us as he intently scans the crowd. He has a quiet word with the funeral bloke and he signals for some guards to come out and announces our presence as the murderer of Majtudin. What ensues is a fight with Templars from both sides of the Third Crusade War, 
along with some archers for good measure. The archers in this equation prove a little too much for me to fight the horde, so I make a getaway on the rooftops, but there are a literal gaggle of guards after me, so I employed the Benny Hill tactic. Robert right now is clearly a woman in disguise, as she is dog shit at fighting and also cries like a little girl. After the horde was dealt with, I wait at the bottom of the ladder and get some cheap shots away on her. The death scene confirms that this was not Robert. They were one step ahead of us. She confirms that we have single-handedly ruined the plans of the Templars for the Holy Land, which is pretty good going, but she says that he has a backup plan. Robert is riding to meet with Salah Hadin and Richard to combine to fight the assassins. Reason being that we've assassinated nine of their key members from both sides, and whilst they were planning to betray, nobody knew this yet, so it would be a good motive for them to overthrow us. As Altair says, they couldn't do it without any backup. We proved that earlier in the game. Altair lets the woman go, as she is not his target. When we come out of the death scene, we wail on her a little more, then she makes a getaway. We'll come back to who this is later. We head back to Malik, telling him we're going to head straight for Robert voicing the reasons we've just learned as why we won't go back to Al Mualim before. We seem to have made a big mistake. Malik protests that we must ask our master. Altair voices his suspicions and tells him to open his eyes. We say our goodbyes and seem to be good friends again at this point. We exit Jerusalem and head out to the front line of the Third Crusade. We fight our way through many strong enemies, which is a really fun challenge with our full array of weapons back as well as well as being versed in how to use them at this stage. Cinematically, the setting and the soundtrack make this feel so epic. We've gone full action man, cutting down lines of enemies to get to our goal, most likely fueled by anger and revenge. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry, I mean our thirst for answers. I had some fun here with the shorter blade. It has a smaller parry window, but much quicker, doing slightly less damage. It feels so good to use, and I wish I'd used it sooner. It also looks so cool just holding it above your head like some kung fu master or some shit. We then arrive at a clearing and we see Robert has already made contact with King Richard. The following cutscene plays out. It's words I bring, not steel. Offering terms of surrender then. It's about time. You misunderstand. It's Al Mualim who sends me, not Salah Hadin. Assassin! What is the meaning of this? And be quick with it! You've a traitor in your midst. And he has hired you to kill me? Come to gloat about it before you strike? I wouldn't be taken so easily! It's not you I've come to kill. It's him. Speak then! That I may judge the truth! Who is this traitor? Robert de Sable. My lieutenant! Ha 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 ha! He aims to betray. That's not the way he tells it. He seeks revenge against your people for the havoc you've wrought in Acre. And I am inclined to support him. Some of my best men were murdered by some of yours. It was I who killed them, and for good reason. Hear me out. William of Montferrat. He sought to use his soldiers to take Acre by force. Gagné de plus. He would use his skills to indoctrinate and control any who resisted. Sabrand. He intended to block the ports preventing your kingdom from providing aid. They betrayed you, and they took their orders from Robert. You expect me to believe this outlandish tale? You knew these men, better than I. Are you truly surprised to learn of their ill intentions? Is this true? My liege, it is an assassin that stands before us. These creatures are masters of manipulation. Of course it isn't true. I've no reason to deceive. Oh, but you do. You're afraid of what will happen to your little fortress. Can it withstand the combined might of the Saracen and the Crusader army? My concern is for the people of the Holy Land. If I must sacrifice myself for there to be peace, so be it. This is a strange place we find ourselves in. Each of you accusing the other. There really is no time for this. I must be off to meet with Saladin and enlist his aid. The longer we delay, the harder this will become. 
Hold a moment, Robert. Why? What do you intend? Surely you do not believe him? It is a difficult decision, one I cannot make alone. I must leave it in the hands of one wiser than I. Thank you. No, Robert, not you. Then who? The Lord. Let this be decided by combat. Surely God will side with the one whose cause is righteous. If this is what you wish. It is. So be it. To arms, assassin! Now, as you can tell from that epic montage, I fucking loved this sequence. It's got the perfect amount of difficulty, ensuring you feel some level of achievement by the end of it. But at the same time, when you do beat it, you feel like you bossed it in every way. The animations are so visceral, and I feel like this is really lost in later games in the series, and just newer games in general. It's got everything for me, and gets a chef's kiss from old bag here. In Robert's death scene, he reveals that a tenth man was leading the Templars. It is Al Mualim. Altair protests, but Robert asks, how did he know where to find all of us if he were not one of us himself? He says that Robert and Altair were just two pawns in Al Mualim's grand game. Now, with Robert's death, he believes Al Mualim will kill Altair after all this is done, as he was the only thing keeping Altair alive. Richard praises us, saying God favoured us. Altair rejects this, saying that it was only skills and no one else helped. Richard asks why he came all this way. Vengeance? Altair says, it is because of peace. Richard again laughs at the irony. Altair tries to preach a peace agreement between Richard and Salah Hadin, but Richard rejects this, saying that we come into this world kicking and screaming and that's how we'll go out. 
He also pokes holes in the vision that free will is a route to peace. Altair points out that Richard is not infallible himself. The people he trusted were going to betray him too. They've both been weakened. They remind each other that they're both human and part ways with a mutual respect. There is, however, no time to bask in the glory. Warren is kicking off as we're thrusted out of the Animus again. We hear gunshots on the intercom. The assassins are here. Warren is blaming us for leading them here, which we obviously didn't do. Apparently there are only five or six of them and they pose a small threat to the Templars. They have more numbers. The intercom confirms that they were neutralized. Desmond pokes fun at him, saying that he was totally scared. But he reminds Desmond that the Templars have systematically eviscerated all of the assassins. There are no more coming. Then he leaves. Lucy is sitting on the Animus. She apologizes to us. She can't promise that our parents are still alive, but she thinks that they have gotten away when the Templars attacked, which is a nice little bit of hope for him to hold on to. She then tells us to have a little faith and does this. Desmond finally gets it. Lucy is an assassin and this makes sense. That's why the assassins were attacking. That's who put the door code in our room, etc, etc. After that Assassin's Creed revelation, she tells us to go to bed and we say, yes, mummy, like a good little boy. After sneaking out for a midnight snack yet again, we go on her emails and obtain the conference room door password. But there's no point in going in here because my dumbass forgot to get Warren's password pen when he was looking out the window earlier in the game. In the morning, however, I pickpocket that motherfucker and we get back into the Animus. When we arrive back, this guy is acting all freaky. We head through Masayef up to the tower. Everyone has clearly gone hollow here. When we get up to the foot of the tower, this happens. The tone here is really eerie and is done really well. We now have to fight our own brothers under the control of Al Mualim somehow. I Benny Hill their asses before heading up to meet Malik. He explains he went back to the temple where we started the game. He read Robert's journal. It divulged all the information about Al Mualim's betrayal. They are both finally on the same page. Altair asks them to divert the attention whilst Altair goes directly for Al Mualim. They agree to avoid killing innocents. They will stick by the creed in doing this. Ah, oh, isn't that cute? We then see this when we arrive at the tower. There are so many innocents. I must be careful not to harm them. Fucking A, this is creepy, man. So uncanny seeing all these really well pathed and realized NPCs just gathered there, quietly focused on our arrival. The rest of the tower is quiet. We make our way through to the garden. The gate shuts behind us. We are restrained by an otherworldly vice. Al Mualim appears on the balcony, holding the artifact. It's very clear now that this has supernatural powers. Altair is not phased by this, still keen on confronting Al Mualim, saying he would never run. Al Mualim tells him he would never listen either, which is why he's in this situation. He ponders what to do with it. He says he can hear hatred in his voice and it would be unwise to let him go. Al Mualim says he found proof that nothing is true and everything is permitted. This saying holds new meaning as all of our previous targets now approach us in the garden. We have to fight them all off and they're pretty hard to be honest as you would imagine. The bodies light up and disappear before us as we chef them up, confirming that this is but an illusion fueled by Al Mualim using the artifact. Al Mualim says he killed thousands of men stronger than us and he is not afraid of us. He then multiplies into 10 different people in a show of power. This wasn't as threatening as I'm pretty sure 10 old men still wouldn't be a problem for Altair and this was right. We got lucky and find the real one quite quickly, but this still was just an illusion. We're still tied up. Altair tells him that he will never succeed as long as man lives. Someone will always be there to oppose him. The cat's out of the bag now as Al Mualim reveals his true goal, to remove free will from man and achieve peace through control. Confirming he's been a Templar all along, Altair says he killed the last man that talked like that. Al Mualim laughs, showing how he has been corrupted. He is now arrogant himself. He does, however, divulge to us that the artifact, for some reason, cannot control our mind. He says that who we are and what we do are too closely intertwined. There is no room for control on a man that is so convicted such as ourselves, which is a really nicely timed accolade to receive. It shows we are truly aligned with a purpose and puts us on a pedestal above all other men. It also adds to the feeling that we are the action hero in this game, but that was already very evident from the last few events. 
He confirms this artifact, a piece of Eden, only shows illusions. He said that the Red Sea never parted, extending on his comment in an earlier conversation to explain the Bible's events. The piece of Eden clearly changed hands throughout history, and the history writers always left out the detail of how such magical and biblical events could take place. There were no miracles. There is no God. It was only this diabolical treasure that corrupts whoever uses it. al Mualim is truly lost here, but he likens this illusion to that of faith and religion. During the Third Crusade, everyone was out there murdering each other in their own God's name, and their gods were nowhere to be seen. What difference is adding another illusion to the others already present in society, one that demands less blood? He does actually make a good point, but morally, Altair is strong and knows that robbing man of his free will is also wrong. He stands by his convictions and the goals of the assassins, but after this, it's time to fight. He condescends us while the Matrix starts to break down. We have to find him in the garden and every time he teleports when we get a hit off. But this doesn't take long and we cheese him with our throwing knives, which I kind of regret to be honest as it completely ruined the fight. But hey ho, it is what it is. Al Mualim drops the apple. Altair then says, which stands for, get ducked on you old bum. No, this obviously stands for, nothing is true, everything is permitted. I don't know why they didn't translate this, but it certainly sounds epic in Arabic. Altair says that he will destroy the artifact. When we leave the cutscene, we hear Al Mualim is reciting the verse we heard in the very first five seconds of the game from Ecclesiastes 1.17 bringing us full circle, and it all makes sense now. Altair stares at the artifact, which is now displaying a globe with markers all over it. This is only a map to other artifacts locations, and there are dozens of them. Altair suddenly stops, saying that he can't destroy it. We hear Al Mualim telling him that he can destroy it, but he won't. This is what the Templars were looking for, not the actual artifact itself, but the location of the others, which is an even bigger problem than we realized. We hear Warren say, We've got it. What the hell was that? Well? We've got the map. How many? At least half a dozen. We don't need them all. We should assume some amount of decay. I can't imagine they'll all still be functioning. At least two appear to reside on land masses that no longer exist. We'll dispatch teams to each site and determine viability. We only need one, after all. What about the rest? Collect them. Let's not leave anything to chance. Last thing we need is some damn survivor making trouble for us in the new world. And the assassin? We have what we need. Kill him. <laughs> you know how these things work. I doubt we'll be able to walk right in. What's your point? We might need him. His memories. I'd recommend we hold him until we have confirmation that there aren't any surprises waiting for us at the sites. This is a waste of time. You said it yourself. We shouldn't leave anything to chance. Very well. Ensure we have no further need of him, then kill him. Fine. Stop undermining my authority! I just saved your ass. Let's go. We've got a lot of work to do. Don't get too comfortable, Mr. Miles. We'll be back for you soon enough. We then see this. We suddenly have access to Altair's eagle vision. This will come to be known in future games as the bleed effect, as we learn our ancestors skills through living in their shoes for so long. On our wall, using eagle visions, we see the following written in blood. It looks like, is that blood? The hell were they keeping here before me? And what happened to them? What does it mean, I wonder? The credits roll, but we're not finished there. Let me tell you what had 12 year old Bag so captivated more than any other game I'd ever played at the time. Altair's story is one of learning and evolving, but also staying true to himself. We see he always possessed the confidence in his own abilities and the ability to think for himself. However, at the start he was very much overconfident, trusted no one but himself, and was too cocky in his abilities. Throughout the story, he literally has to start from the bottom and work his way back to where he was at the start. When we eventually get there with him, he's got all his gear and rank back, etc, but he's better than he was before. 
This isn't through a drastic clear out of all things that made Altair Altair though, which is what some stories do. He still has the core character traits that make him him, but they are more honed and firmly grounded as a result of the journey he's been on with us. Let me give you an example. Altair's character was always confident, overconfident at the start and almost got his friends killed. Now he is still confident but never overconfident. It's not like they stripped out all elements of his confidence to cure the negative character trait. It's a good bit of story writing. Another example, Altair thinks for himself. In the beginning, he clearly trusted no one and misunderstood the Creed's ways. It would have been easy for that lack of trust to be removed from his character by the end of the game to show his successful arc and adapt the story so that his trust leads him to success. Instead, they still portray him as untrusting when it's valid and assertive in his suspicions. He retains the ability to think for himself. It's literally this core character trait that actually leads to success. He suspects Al-Mulim, trusts his own compass enough to not brush it under the rug like the others do and is confident to act on it. This trait literally saves his life throughout the game and in the final battle with Al-Mulim and essentially saves the Holy Land entirely as a result. He had these traits all along, he's just better at it now, really good writing, and that's one of the reasons why he's always going to be the best girl. I also love what AC1 has to say about religion. Now I know many of us don't think it's real, yada yada, but I love the way they ripped out the illusions of miracles and gods and people that can perform miracles and wrote a whole backstory that is fully explainable by the in-universe rules, like an ancient race that had technology far greater than our own, and remnants of that technology, all scientific, was what we called miracles back in the day. God, we look stupid, don't we? I love how it doesn't over-explain too, but lets your mind wander. If Moses used an artifact to part the Red Sea, then Jesus turning water into wine was also explainable. The burning bush in the Bible, it was an illusion probably from the very artifact we're focused on in this game. When I was 12, this blew my little mind. I felt enlightened. Me and another kid at school actually had the same experience and we used to obsess over this to the point that it kind of became our religion, our truth. It was certainly more plausible than any other truth we'd come across, so why not? Obviously, this is also developed in the other games and this only made things worse. I'll definitely cover it in another video, but the mini games in the Ezio series where you hover over paintings looking for the apple and stuff, showing that all people of power, even Adolf Hitler I think, used this thing to control people's minds. That only made more sense, you know? Like, yeah of course, I'd always wondered how the Holocaust could even take place. The amount of people that would have had to ignore what was going on, you know? This is where that all started, and that's why I love this game. It really didn't need to go full hog wild like this. It would still be a decent game without this level of depth, but because it did, this and the following two or three mainline games are up there with my favourite games ever. They literally changed the way I saw the world. I started to question everything. I started seeing holes in logic that were not perceivable to me before. I'd gone off the deep end in a kind of cool way. The way AC1 respects history and religion, but also is brave enough to explain its gaps, this well led me, as I said earlier, to taking certain lessons at college. I took history of art for one, which I had no interest in before. I remember each lesson we'd look at a painting that I'd already seen in an Assassin's Creed 2 minigame, or a building that was perfectly recreated in the game would be the topic of another architecture lesson. I remember telling my teacher the reason why I knew all the answers, because of Assassin's Creed, and she knew what I was talking about. She said it's a great way to pass the tests, by playing this video game. How cool is that? I also took extra philosophy classes when I was in high school before taking it at college, because I wanted to know more questions that didn't have answers. What more did I assume to be knowledge, but was only belief? On top of this, I took psychology also. Anyway, you get the picture. To wrap this all up, it's an incredible story with an incredible soundtrack and great visuals for the time. And I think it's clear why I remember this game above anything else that happened on Christmas 2007. It really did change the path of my life. It will always hold a special place in my heart because of that. Now, we've got a couple of things I want to go back and cover. I didn't want to focus on Ada at the time as she was essentially written in after the game. But the fish hook we saw earlier from one of the assassins we did a mission for deserves analysing, but I'll keep it brief. Ada, also known as the Chalice, is obviously a central character in Assassin's Creed Altair's Chronicles. She's believed to be a powerful artefact in human form, coveted by both the assassins and the Templars during the Third Crusade. Ada has a significant romantic and emotional connection with Altair. Their relationship is highlighted by their shared history and mutual affection. Despite their deep bond, Ada is ultimately captured by the Templars and is ultimately killed too. 
and this deeply affects Altair and influences character development throughout the series. Ada is of Syrian descent and is highly regarded for her wisdom and spiritual significance. Her title, The Chalice, stems from her perceived ability to unite people and her association with ancient prophecies. Altair and Ada share a profound connection that dates back to before the events of Altair's Chronicles and Assassin's Creed 1. She actually ends up dying in Altair's Chronicles and we obviously never see her in Assassin's Creed 1. Throughout the game, Altair embarks on a mission to rescue Ada from the Templars. Despite his efforts, she is eventually captured and taken away, leaving Altair devastated. And this is one of his quotes from his codex. I had thought Ada would be the one to lead me to rest, that I might lay down my blade and live as a normal man but now I know such dreams are best left to sleep. So how did she die? Well, as I said, the Templars had captured her and were going away with her on a ship. Altair pursued the Templar ship across the Mediterranean Sea, but in the end, when he got there, they killed her. She was executed by the Templars, and he could do little but cradle her lifeless body in his arms once he found her. Ada's death would go on to haunt Altair for the next year or more as he embarked on a quest for revenge hunting down each and every last man responsible for her demise, so thorough that there was not a single crusader with any connection to her murder that remained alive by the time he was finished. In spite of this, he was unable to derive any solace from their deaths, and he returned to the assassins, numbed and heartbroken from his tragedy. The loss of Ada obviously affects Altair in a huge way, shaping his motivations and resolve. Her capture and the inability to save her become pivotal moments in Altair's development before we even start Assassin's Creed 1. You see what this means? This explains why Altair was a dick in the first place. This one throwaway line, the PSP spin-off off of that line, all ties back into why he was the way he was at the start of Assassin's Creed 1. He lost the love of his life, and that's when we first meet him. This, this is incredible story writing. Now I could go on for hours about Assassin's Creed lore, that started here. You know that lady that was posing as Robert? She is a huge character in the series. She is also Desmond's ancestor. That's right, her and Altair end up marrying and having kids later in the series. This is where the bloodline starts, and I'll find it really hard not to go on and cover those other games after this if I'm completely honest. They were just so good. The last thing I want to touch on are the symbols and emails you can access on Warren's computer at the end of the game, as they further reinforce the depth of this story. The way it intertwines real life events and history, it's absolutely masterful. However, this part of the video will essentially just turn into a wiki style analysis of the symbols we've been seeing throughout the game uh, and on the floors and walls at the end of the game and tying them into the story and information we get from Mora's computer. So if that bores you, I completely understand. Do me a favor now though, drop a like, subscribe and hit the bell icon as it means the absolute world to me. So where to start? Outside of Desmond's room, on the floor, we see this. The first thing to cover is the Eye of Providence, a symbol of watchfulness, alluding to the Templar's ultimate goal of controlling mankind. We also see an apple atop a pyramid of Eden, an original design consisting of a series of eyes bound within a triangle, with a radiating apple directly above it. It symbolizes the Templar plan to send a piece of Eden into orbit in order to control all beneath it. We also see a square of letters, when read from bottom to top and right to left, spells out artifacts sent to the skies to control all nations, to make us obey a hidden crusade. Do not help them. We also see an upside down pentagram, which is usually associated with evil and satanism. Note that one prong of the star points directly to the head of the animus. This is an attempt by whoever wrote this to show that the animus is used for evil purposes. Whilst throughout history the pentagram is usually affiliated with satanic rituals, its origins come from the Roman goddess Venus, as the planet Venus forms a pentagram in space. This is sort of explained in further games, but it's, uh, it's the way of saying that Venus, along with many other Greek gods of Roman mythology, were actually just first civilization beings, but again we'll come to that on another video. There's also a pyramid of letters when read from bottom to top and right to left spells out they drained my soul and made it theirs. I drained my body to show you where I saw it. Now this is obviously alluding to who wrote this, saying that they obviously delved into his soul using the animus and took his knowledge. And then he's saying that he drains his body to tell you more and give you more information. So this confirms that what you're looking at is actually written in blood. We also see a barcode and a date. The numbers 122 12 make the date 21st of December 2012, 
in the Middle Indian format. The barcode, however, encodes the number 666. So there's two things it's alluding to here. Obviously, everyone knew what happened in 2012. Everyone thought it was the Mayan calendar saying the world's going to end and then it didn't happen. But cool that a game from 2007 sort of picked up on this in the future. And then obviously 666 is the number of the devil. There's a couple of things I don't really know why they're there, like the Borromean rings. But um, there's also the Nazca lines, uh, hummingbird, monkey and spider. Now, this is referenced in future games or just general Assassin's Creed lore that uh, a piece of Eden is located in Nazca, Peru, where you find these things in the real world. And they're actually like a wonder of the world in real life. So it's cool to say, like, linking those things, that uh, there was obviously an ancient civilization that lived there. And it kind of explains those unknown things in real life. I think it's really cool. Building on that, you can see Yonaguni, which is an island off of Japan with an underwater formation that is most likely, well, it's not natural, so it's man-made or ancient civilization made maybe and adjacent to the text there are three symbols outlines of mount fuji a japanese tori and two nara style pagodas just to contextualize what they're trying to say there there's obviously an ancient mystery underwater so we know by now that that's a ancient civilization doing we also see the eye of horus whilst this may be a reference to horus in egypt it's also a reference to a german austrian order similar to the freemasons which was believed to be related to the knights templar and which had a eye of Horus drawn at the top of their layman. Then we also see the three triangles, most likely indicating the pyramids of Giza, not only uh, an unknown ancient sort of wonder of the world, but in Assassin's Creed lore is a, another location for a piece of Eden. We also see a step pyramid, which is a common symbol of Mayan and Egyptian architecture. And we see a mountain valley, uh, which is, I can say this, this is Machu Picchu. I've been there. That's what it looks like. So I guess it's probably ancient civilization doing or has a piece of Eden there or something. Then when we move into Desmond's room, we see uh, a ton of stuff. So let's start with the Mandelbrot set. Now the Mandelbrot set is basically like an equation in maths, as I understand it, that is really simple. And the formula is actually written on the wall too. Z n plus one equals Z n squared plus C. And it's like this really simple equation that just creates absolute chaos. So if you like, like Google it, go on, um, go on Google and type in Mandel, Mandelbrot set experience or like, so you can go through this fractal and it's pretty cool. Like uh, if you know the story behind how it's actually made, um, which I barely do, it's like an equation that obviously when visualized just creates the most beautiful chaos. So I, I'm not really sure how that relates to Assassin's Creed, maybe the theory around chaos and control, uh, something like that. I don't know the explanation for all of these, but there's also 13.0000, which is a Mayan long count calendar date, and it corresponds to 21st December 2012, when we all thought the world was going to end, as we mentioned earlier. There's also some writing that says, we are all books containing thousands of pages, and within each of them lies an irreparable truth. The books are in reference to humans and how the thousands of pages symbolize our ancestors' memories. Therefore, the truth cannot be erased or repaired, even if the Templars try to rewrite history, we can always access literal history using our memories. There's also 13, 16, 18, which is a Bible reference, Revelations, which describes the number of the beast, 666. Additionally, it describes the mark of the beast, a reference to an implantable microchip used by the Templars, which is, I guess, Assassin's Creed lore, but also law of conspiracies in real life. There's also an Omega symbol and a Bible reference to, again, Revelations, um, which quotes, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This verse is a declaration of God's power over the world, which modern day Templars in universe strive to achieve. Um, and it's also the, the thing that your dad says at the beginning of Fallout 3. There's also this like hip bone looking swirly drawing, which is actually the Lorenz attractor. It's another mathematical concept on graphs, I think, or an equation that creates chaos, which again, alluding to the same stuff I said earlier. There's some Chinese writing that reads, hearing is better than not hearing, observing is better than hearing, knowing is better than observing, and doing is better than knowing. So it's kind of like a philosophical concept that, you know, your sense of hearing is not necessarily that trustworthy, observing slightly better than tr hearing, but still not fully trustworthy. Knowing is obviously pretty good, but doing, experiencing is the true form of, of knowledge, essentially. You can't, you can't 
second guess what happens. Uh, but yeah, that's a philosophical concept that uh, you could look into like Descartes and stuff like that if you wanted to look into it in more detail. So yeah, that's like the ones I wanted to talk about. But who wrote all this shit, huh? That is explained in other games and I'll save it for another video. But when we look into Warren's emails, it confirms that we are by far not the first person to go through this process with the Animus. When we access the laptop in the conference room, also Warren's, there are emails from Alan Rickin adding a bit more context to our journey in the Animus. He knows this as Subject 17 and confirms that there are obviously 16 others that have gone through the same thing. It also alludes to the satellite that the Templars want to send into space using a different piece of Eden. Again, that symbol we touched on earlier. Noting that if this doesn't control everyone's minds, then we still need the other artifacts to pick up the pieces. They really want total control. It doesn't matter if one or two people aren't controlled by this giant satellite thing. It's, it's not good enough. I like how consistent the themes and messages are here. It all makes sense and aligns with the Templar's goals. As long as there are two people outside of their mind controls, this is still a threat to them. Alan also talks about the Philadelphia Project. Now this is another real world event, like, look it up. Apparently in 1943, the US Navy tried to make a naval ship disappear and actually did it. Not only did it disappear, but there are accounts of it reappearing 200 miles away. Men aboard another ship claims to see it appear briefly, then disappear again. Had you ever heard of this before this game? I certainly hadn't. And Alan is explaining that they are testing a subject that was present using the Animus. And guess what was behind the phenomena? Yes, it was a piece of Eden. This game is genuinely so tight for stuff like this. There are other bits in the emails, like new emails that contribute to a, a bit of world building. But they cover the same ground, and I, I think I've made my point and shown off just how deep this game is. All of this is completely optional, by the way. All of this work, completely optional to the story. It was unnecessary, really. But for those who looked into it, it made it stand apart and above so many other stories they'll ever come across in their lifetimes, especially with that slot Ubisoft is releasing today. Like, if they sold Assassin's Creed 1 today, this depth for one would not be present for sure, but if it was, it would cost like $100 extra, and it would be called the Enlightened Edition or something. <clears throat> so, there we have it. We finally come to the end of this video. I hope I've managed to convey the impact this game had on my life and why. And I truly think this game, being the starting point for the whole series, is criminally underrated. I never hear anyone talking about it. I encourage you to go and check it out and, of course, the subsequent games after that. So, thank you all so much for watching. Love you all so much. Bye-bye.